Um, as Steve said, we're very excited to feature Kathleen Flanagan, Washington State's newly appointed Poet Laureate, at this evening's closing program for Particles on the Wall. We're also honored that when we first invited Kathleen to participate in the exhibit's inaugural launch in 2010 at the Agro Cafe, she said yes, contributing her beautiful Richland Dock broadside, which um, is back on the table back there, and she's been a contributor since. Kathleen's first book, Famous, won the Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry and was named a notable, notable book by the American Library Association and a finalist for the Washington State Book Award. Her second collection, Plume, was selected for the Pacific Northwest Poetry Series and is now out um, from University of Washington Press. Kathleen's honors include fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and Artists Trust and a Pushcart Prize. She holds an MFA in Creative Writing from the Rainier Writing Workshop and teaches poetry through Seattle's Writers in the Schools Program, Jack Straw, and other arts agencies. She is a co-editor and president of Floating Bridge Press and president of the board at Jack Straw. Kathleen is also a Richland native. The poems in Plume explore the atomic age through Hanford and its legacy, a unique time and place dissected with her own distinctive insights and wisdom. Having first worked as a civil engineer and hydrologist, including three years on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, Kathleen has said she came to poetry late. Yet given the intensity of today's nuclear concerns, she gives us her collection, Plume, at exactly the right time. It's a great pleasure to introduce you to this remarkable poet who with a scientist's eye and a poet's voice unearths new worlds. Kathleen. Thank you all so much for coming. Can you hear me okay? Okay, thank you so much to Nancy Dickman and Diane Dickman and Steve Gilbert for, for having the vision of this, of this uh, Particles on the Wall exhibit. I'm very proud to be part of it and to have been part of it from the beginning. And I wanted to start out tonight by reading a poem by um, William Witherup, who was, who was an absent partner here tonight, but certainly in our minds. And I wanted to begin with a poem called Downwind, Downriver, which is a beautiful and angry poem. And we all come to this subject with a different eye and a different reaction. And I really respond to this poem. I could never have written this poem, but I am so glad that he did. Um, Downwind, Downriver. And it's for Frederick Wayne Nelson, Downriver, who was in the biopath of the Green Run, 1949. Oh, say can you breathe by the dawn's early wind what so proudly we made at Hanford Engineering Works. Iodine-131, plutonium, ruthenium. At the dawn's early light, irradiated meadowlarks filled a young boy's heart with isotopes of beauty. Particle and wave shimmered over the river stones. What so proudly we hailed, looking for arrowheads after my morning paper route by the hot Columbia, bike sparkling with flakes of mica, not mica. Roll on Columbia, Woody. Salmon smolt stunned as they hit the outflow plumes. As twilight's last gleaming, I-131 sifting on sage and thistle, on sweet, newly cut alfalfa. Plutonium in the hog swill, ruthenium in the jackrabbit's eye. The pure products of America go crazy. By the dawn's early light, Hiro Hiroshima, Hiroshima flickers white hot, Nagasaki fuses with the sun. Particle and wave, what physicists proudly hailed, who used murderous intellect to invent deadly winds, military and scientific elite gassing their own workers, soldiers, and children. Downriver, downwind, I-131, plutonium, ruthenium. And I want to read a poem. This is, I'm reading out of the Particles on the Wall book, which is a beautiful book. Um, I have the hard copy version, the old fashioned, not the ebook version. Um, I wanted to read this poem by Deborah Greger, who is also someone who I've 
been inspired by. She wrote a book, I think it came out in 1996, called, um, I think it's called Desert Fathers, Uranium Daughters. And it's not entirely about Richland, but Richland is definitely a main character in that book. And it's, it's a very, very interesting collection, really strong collection. She's a wonderful poet. So this is called Ship Burial. Hanford, Washington, take these treasures, earth, now that no one living can enjoy them, from Beowulf. On great stone wings, a hawk hovered in the great dusty hall of the sky. Below, in the shade of a lowly sagebrush, a rabbit dug its own grave. An official sang out from time to time, sharply, almost dreamily, to a bulldozer pushing back the earth, back where it came from, as if to plunge a great ship deeper into the dirt, that the dead might make the voyage from this world to the next more easily. The ship bore bread and candles, irradiated fuel rods, the half-lives of mother and daughter isotopes, stout leather shoes. Like gold leaf, the dust scattered, over the ship set adrift, the wind hurried the waves of sand, the hill dead ahead. Coffee was poured from its flask, the dregs flung upon the ground. So in the desert they buried the heart of the nuclear submarine. Okay. So I want to say thank you to the University of Washington Press for publishing Plume. Um, I thank my editor, Linda Beards, for believing in the manuscript. Um, believe it or not, this isn't the most uplifting book in the whole world, so <laughs> I'm really sorry that there aren't more funny poems in it. I don't think I'm going to read you any funny poems tonight, but um, what I did bring is a little bit of a slideshow. I don't usually show pictures with the poems, but I thought I'd take advantage of the venue. And I, I pulled all of these slides, except for this first one, from a, a site that you should know about. It's called the, Do the Declassified Document Retrieval System. And it's online. And there's something like 70,000 photographs that are available um, to anybody who wants to look for them from the Hanford site, and I think, I think like 130,000 documents, something like that. So, for instance, I can type in my dad's name and I can find some of his reports by, by plugging that in. I also found a picture of my mother who sang in a group called the Treble Clef when she, in the 1950s. So I just typed in Treble Clef and I found these pictures and I found her in the back row. So it, it's just really interesting. So I didn't want to compete with my poems, so I brought one slide for each poem. Um, this is a picture of Cedar Street, for those of you from Richland. Um, the Ranch House District, that's where I grew up. I grew up on Cottonwood Drive, and this is what it looked like probably in 1952, something like that. Um, I was born in 1960, but I still, I. I can identify with a lot of these pictures. My first poem um, is called Bedroom Community. And it's just a kind of, it's actually the very first of the Richland poems that I wrote. We were all bedded down in our nightcaps, curtains drawn as swamp coolers and sprinklers hissed every brown summer hour, or in winter, sagebrush hardened in the cold. It was still dark as our fathers rose, dressed, and boarded blue buses that pulled away, and men in milk trucks came collecting bottled urine from our doorsteps. Beyond the shelter belt of Russian olive trees, cargo trains shuffled past at eight and eight, and by the wide and the wide Columbia rolled by, silent with walleye and steelhead. We pulled up our covers while our overburdened fathers dragged home to fix a drink, and some of them grew sick. Carolyn, your father's marrow testified. Whistles from the train, the buses came, the fathers left. Oh, Carolyn, while the rest of us slept. 
uh, Carolyn's father is a character in this book. Carolyn is too. Um, her father died of a radiation illness um, in the 1980s. And that was, it didn't seem possible that such a thing could happen to me. It took me something like 20 years to make sense of his death, to make sense of some of the, the information that came out in declassified documents um, from the 1980s. And so I didn't really start writing this book until about 2005, I think. This poem's called Mosquito Truck. Um, for those of you that grew up in the area, you, um, they, we used to have these trucks that drive through the neighborhood and they would blast DDT out the back of the truck and, and that's bad enough, but then the kids would all jump on their bikes and ride along behind and breathe it in. In fact, I, I talked to one guy recently who said he used to go, he'd, he'd be on the lookout for it, he'd be listening for it, he'd go find it and he'd ride along behind. And then at night he would actually take off his shirt and he'd put it on his pillow and he'd sleep with it all night because he loved the smell. <laughs> okay, mosquito truck. Come in now, come in, my father commanded, hearing its slow progress up Cottonwood Drive even if this were one of those fine evenings that seemed to last into tomorrow. One of those fine evenings every kid on the street was out on a banana seat bike or dribbling a basketball or still wet in a swimsuit and running in the yard. And the aluminum sashes tight in their frames announced we were slamming our windows to the entire neighborhood, which made it worse somehow to be publicly stuck inside while the rumbling approached like an army of liberators. Then the truck itself with its glorious spray and billowing sweet-smelling chemical clouds, its pea soup fog. All the kids but us rode and ran along behind, those flashy stingrays with their tasseled handlebars, little towheads and big brothers who hooped and hollered, breathing deep and willing themselves not to cough, who pulled wheelies and pinwheels as if they were rodeo stars in a parade. Which this was, the driver, as benevolent as if he were dispensing ice cream, waved and grinned into his side view mirror. Hello, hello, what summer entertainment. Damn kids, my father would say, shaking his head, and probably right. And this next poem is the one that's uh, it's downstairs. There's a, I have a broadside of this poem. Uh, it's called Richland Dock, 2006. I think of the river as one of the characters in this book, too, sort of the silent it's the silent type. Richland Dock 2006. The Columbia rolls on through the desert, unimpressed and unattached. A woman who doesn't need boys to dance. A king's parade of golden carriages, an endless line of warrior ants. The river speaks French in a land of inferior grammar. The river is blue in a field of brown, green in a field of gray, black in a field of bronze. The river shuns the desert. It holds its tongue. It saves itself for the ocean. The river is fast, undammed, Rapunzel's hair let down, and won't allow this shrub-step plain to climb it. The river won't lend itself to grow a tree. Look, sagebrush flush with its banks. No meeting, no kiss, no marriage. Look at the tumbleweeds. The river bathes in its glory. The desert eats dust. The river belongs to somewhere else. The mighty river passes, not touching, but not untouched. That's actually a picture of laundry, doing laundry out at Hanford. And this is a poem uh, called The Days of Clotheslines um, about our next door neighbor. Mother pinned laundry to the backyard breeze, while Mrs. Mumford's voice darted over the tall fence, plumb to pear and back like a bird. Her accent deeply southern, her face obstructed and forgotten, so substitute the pushed-in features of her boxer dog, Sue. 
Our family sheets breathed in and out while Mrs. Mumford's voice insisted cancer, cancer, as if calling it home. Her doctors couldn't find it. Sue looked mean, but loved to be padded through the slats. Mother named these monologues getting caught for hours. Mr. Mumford already dead, and his widow listed off other neighbors with cancer, too. Cancer in the air, cancer everywhere. Flop down in the grass, face up, I searched the clouds, wagons hoe, migrating left to right, billowing abandoned laundry. Doctors, given chance after chance, finally discovered Mrs. Mumford was right. She brought the news to Mother formally in our living room, dressed up with the best grammar she could find. The whites of remembered laundry are blue-white. She willed it, my mother used to say. Sue was a sweet dog, but unforgivably ugly. Even as I petted her, I didn't want to. Thinking about that time when um, our neighbor was thinking she had cancer, somehow I, I lost touch with that idea that she might have thought she had cancer because of Hanford. I, we, I just thought she just thought she had cancer because her husband died of cancer. I didn't kind of put it all together. It's one of those things where as you start writing, then you realize that you've sort of played games with yourself. You do these sort of mental head games where you put things in different categories and they don't talk to each other. And it's, it's, it, this, the whole process of writing this book has been very interesting, finding these sort of dividers in my mind and trying to sort of take them out. This is called Whole Body Counter, Marcus Whitman Elementary. When I was in kindergarten, um, this truck came in and landed, uh, came in and, and parked on the blacktop at our school. And everybody in the school, every child in the school, went through the whole body counter. And I, this is sort of a cultural touchstone for us. And I've never heard why they did that or what they did with the information. It's just something that we, as kids, we remember doing. Um, I did find online a reference in a health physics magazine from November 1965, which had been right about that time. It says, uh, the mobility of this new laboratory provides versatile capabilities for measuring internally deposited gamma ray emitting radionuclides in human beings. Whole Body Counter, Marcus Whitman Elementary. We were told to close our eyes. Everyone was school age now, our kindergarten teacher reminded us, old enough to follow directions and do a little for our country. My turn came, and the scientist strapped me in, and a steady voice prompted, the counter won't hurt, lie perfectly still. And mostly I did, and imagined what children pretend America is. Parks bordered by feathery evergreens, lawns so green and lush they soothe the eyes and pupils open like love. A whole country of lawns like that. Just once I peeked and the machine had taken me in like a spaceship and I moved slow as the sun through the chamber's smooth steel sky. I shut my eyes again and pledged to be still, so proud to be a girl America could count on. Somebody tonight mentioned uh, patriotism that seems to appear in this poem quite a bit, and I have to answer that I, I think it's Richland, growing up in Richland, it was a very patriotic place, but it wasn't something we talked about. It was more something that was lived, and um, it was it was just kind of insidious, I think. It was sort of a hidden motive maybe behind some of the ways we behave. But this is an argument I've actually had with my brother. He doesn't buy this idea that people were especially patriotic. He just thinks it was a job for people. And I, I think that there, there was a reason people took their lives in their hands sometimes. I think they thought they were doing important work. So I guess that's, we'll, we'll continue to, to think about that. Um, this next poem is in six parts. Uh, and 
it's a combination of poems and quotations from a man named Herbert Parker. And Herbert Parker was the original head of the f health physics department at Hanford. He actually started the health physics department and he was responsible, I think of him as the last valve between the plant and the environment. He was in charge of monitoring uh, workers' health, but also monitoring uh, uh, releases to, to the air, to the water, to groundwater. So he was monitoring all of these environmental pathways as the plants started gearing up, going, and progressing. And this was all brand new science. And so he was, they were learning on the fly. And I think about him and what he must have had to deal with as he got more and more information that, you know, radiation was going up and up and up in some of these pathways. So this is called The Augean Suite. And the first poem is The Fifth Labor of Hercules. Aegeus's vast herds of cattle were divine, but their shit was earthly and divinely abundant. The stench hung over the valley palpable. Nobody waded into the fouled stable without drowning. This gave Hercules his idea to divert two rivers, the Alpheus and the Peneus, and sluice the filth away, which he finished in a single day. Then he slew King Augeus to remind us the world belongs to gods and kings, that exacting justice is worthier than atoning for sins. No more mention of the two gangrenous rivers, the women downstream washing clothes, or their children bathing. Number two, Augean Gray, 1954. Flakes emitted from the process stack could be discerned by the eye, the way one might hear the taps of countless leather soles treading a busy bu bus lot, and yet not attend them, not notice their drift and fall. Say the click of my mother's heels as she pushed one baby in a carriage and pulled another by the hand through the nearby village in August, as it snowed radio ruthenium. She wouldn't know to listen. If only she'd thought to ask why snow fell that summer. If only the villagers had asked why 17,000 signs were erected all over the desert to keep off the grass. Internal Report, Herbert M. Parker, 1954. And this is entirely in his, in his uh, language. One can picture the entire population of Richland lying unclothed on the ground for one day. There would be about 25 identifiable particles in contact with skin. Not more than three would be in an activity type range that could produce a significant effect. Not more than one would probably produce an effect. At the worst, there would be a small necrotic area, perhaps comparable with the effect of plunging a lighted match head to the skin. My best guess is that this would not happen in one day's contact with the hottest known off-site particle. Pig skin and human skin are sufficiently alike that if the pig can wear a 400 millirad per hour particle for five days, I would be willing to wear one for one day. Four. Aji and Gray. Women, oops. <laughs> Women, take off your dresses and undergarments. You babies, crawl naked in the grass. Lie down, all of you, under the August sky, and nobody ask. Questions alarm and weaken our nation. It is snowing. Your men are at work making snow. I will go first and close my eyes, cross the distance between here and winter. Lie down, patriot. Don't ask. The Graying of Herbert Parker, 1956. And this includes some of Herbert Parker's language. 
There will be through the course of the years a very slow build-up, he said. One knows the final answer only some 10, 20, or 30 years from now. He said, perhaps by the time the deposit becomes a hazard, the true permissible levels will be known. And the word permissible was downy as fine snow. It is rather easy to show, he said, an undesirable tendency to concentrate where least desired, as though Jack Frost had touched his mind. The obvious hazard is not always, flakes started falling in earnest. One might almost dare to say not usually the real hazard, while snow drifted behind his eyes. And this is entirely in Mr. Parker's language. He, was, he made a statement to Congress in 1962. Mr. Parker, if we accept the principle of acceptable risk in radiation exposure, and there is no alternative today, instead of black and white, we have only infinite gradation of gray from perhaps a black relating to significant overexposure, grading down but never reaching white. It is beyond our wits to quantify such a scale, yet the attempt has to be made at least to define bands of gray. The three ranges as used by the Federal Radiation Council, I think, are precisely such an attempt which I have translated into fashionable color terminology, with range one being Arcadian gray, range two being Achillean gray, and range three being Augean gray. Representative Hosmer, do you have a color chart with you? Mr. Parker, I'm not able to put precise numbers on these shades of gray, but I classify Arcadian gray as pure and clean for the relevant purpose, and Augean gray containing a reference to the well-known stables of history, and the middle range, if I may clarify that, as I recall Achilles, he was pretty sound, but he had a couple of weak spots, one on each heel. Okay. In, um, in 2003, excuse me, in the year 2000, uh, the Department of Energy invited workers at Hanford to speak publicly about their health problems for the very first time. And it was an evening, I believe Hanford Challenge actually has a video of this online. Um, this event. And it was a chance for people to come up and talk about things that they've never felt comfortable talking about. And it's very moving. I have a copy of the transcript. It's very moving to, to read what they say. Um, you could also have a sense of how difficult is, it is for them to speak about this. You know, it's, it's almost like a disloyalty. This poem's called Deposition. I wasn't there. I'd packed my car with house plants years ago, confident my rawhide neighbors would change their camper's oil, mow and edge their lawns like always, street after street of Hanford workers who'd moved 30 years ago from West Virginia or Pennsylvania or Tennessee for a job. No saying what it was. For a prefab landscaped with white rocks. For their kids grown up like me. For their wives hair freshly done, comparing prices at Safeway. You know one, you know them all, I said at 25, and moved away, brushed off the dust, and breathed in the liberal city. So I wasn't there when one by one they rose, walked stiffly up the aisle in the Federal Building Auditorium. And yet I see them clearly, the same bastards who grinned when schoolgirls strolled by, who flirted with John Birch, and hunted pheasant, and owned their stools at the cinder block taverns downtown, whose sons and daughters would appear at school sometimes with bruises on their arms. Carolyn was there to testify, and even she can't explain how anybody there met anybody else's eyes. It must have choked their throats like rotting meat, admitting to cancers and hothouse flower blood diseases, each a different suffering. How did they stand on stage and say what nobody could say aloud? And the ones who came but couldn't speak. It's killing to think of, even now. 
every one of them ashamed for falling ill the way the anti-nuke fanatics said we would, who've never known shit about anything, who've never understood us, and never will. I'm going to read one more poem out of this book, and then one more final poem. Um, when About two years ago, I went to uh, Washington, D.C., and visited the Smithsonian, and at the American History Museum, right across the aisle from Julia Child's kitchen, is um, an exhibit on science and society. And one of the rooms in that exhibit is devoted to Hanford. And when I walked in there, I didn't realize that that was there. And I found this very moving. And I, I ended up, it's not a very large room, but I ended up just standing in there for about 90 minutes and watching people come in. And I'd follow them sort of around and see what they looked at. And they'd go step up to the T-shirt with the bomb on it, and I'd watch them. And that's my high school, you know. And then they'd move on to other things. And... I just sort of lingered there for a long time. It felt, there was something about that. It felt gratifying that, you know, this work, it's such a mixed bag. You know, I'm, I'm proud and I'm, I'm just, I feel betrayed. I'm, you know, it's just every, everything under the sun. And it was all right there in that little room. And right after that room, there's an exhibit of Nagasaki photos of victims. And this poem is about that room. Museum of Doubt, Nagasaki photos. My love, allow yourself to stall just a little, then enter the collection of black and white victims. Like ink blots, they await your reply. Focus, I'm holding your hand. Their shadows on bridges and walls stop at 1102 like interrupted sundials. That, at least, you can respond to. You'll never make sense of rubble. The raw body proves difficult braille. Illness you can fathom with its slippers scuffing along a glassy hall. But can you feel it? A kimono pattern imparted to the wearer's skin. Beloved, you've been carefully trained. Do you sense your resistance? Meaning is lost between the vulnerable eye and well-defended mind. Who's on your side, you keep asking. Not righteousness, not at this late hour. Look at you unsure, but sure underneath. And then, that was, we'll go with that one. And then I'm going to read a poem to, to, to finish off by our Nancy Dickman. I think this is a beautiful poem. It's called 50th Anniversary Remembrance. After a summer of calm and heat, the pink calla lilies one bloom curled under. The day has fallen to, wa to wind and water, the lake's still sheen overcome with concentric crests. A crowd has gathered in remembrance, Hiroshima caught beneath their tongues, fusion of history and the unspeakable, moment when light shattered the city, a man pushing a cart turned to shadow a figure wrapped around a huge cup as though the skeleton were indelible the image burnished into the stone path there is no absolution only sorrow lanterns set in the water with hope the dead may rest the crowd lines the dock lowering the lit boxes into the lake the ramp glowing with candlelight and the bent shapes I have sent mine off with shared wishes for the past and future, time's culmination. The thick stalks along the bank weave a line that holds the lantern's return to shore, paper sheaths singed by flame, smoke and ash floating across the moon's changing face in the water, shard, flask, a scrim of filament and fossil, and across the open wild irises, their yellow petals flared like torches circling the lake. Thank you very much.